Committee. We have four uh, substantive items today, members. Uh, the first is a briefing from the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission uh, on their annual statement. The second is a written briefing uh, from the Department on progress of the Barroso Task Force desk officers uh, covering the period of July to September last. Uh, we then have uh, a statutory rule uh, to consider in draft form. Uh, this is regarding proposed fair employment uh, and an amendment to the specification of public authorities. Uh, and finally, we're going into closed session uh, for further consideration of our proposals uh, to reform and update the Office uh, of the Ombudsman. Uh, but at this stage, I would propose, uh, with, um, with your acceptance, uh, given the fact that that closed session starts with two briefings from Assembly Research, uh, we allow the Ombudsman and Deputy Ombudsman uh, into the committee room so that they can hear the briefings uh, from research. We have apologies uh, from Leslie Cree and Brenda Hale noted. Any others? Apologies, Stephen Mitri. Stephen Mitri, thank Alex you. Alex will be late. And Alex will be late. Okay, thank you very much. Members, uh, at page five, you'll see a request uh, from the Committee on Administration of Justice uh, to brief us on its report entitled uh, On Equal Relations. Uh, it seems to me this falls into an area that uh, the committee staff are already uh, researching in terms of together building a united uh, community. I wonder whether you uh, find it agreeable if the chair and deputy chair in the first instance had an informal meeting with CAJ to which other members uh, could attend if they so, so wish. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Uh, page six is an invitation uh, to myself to attend a colloquium uh, on model rules uh, for EU administrative procedures. Uh, it's on the 7th uh, of February. And as it's a colloquium, somebody will have already guessed it's uh, an invite from the Attorney General. Um, I think all the chairs have got that. Sorry? I think all the chairs have got that. Are you intending to go, Jimmy? <coughs> I don't know yet. I have to yeah. get closer to the time. Yeah. Uh, what I'm wondering is uh, whether it actually be the most profitable thing to do would be to send uh, somebody from research, mm. leaving it open for a... You know, I, I haven't said yes or no, but I think it would be useful. Look, can we do that on the basis of the invite? They're giving us a personal mm. invite. Yeah, well, I think if, if, if the committee's happy, we'll go back and uh, see how the Attorney General's people would feel. I, I think there is a precedent for researchers attending colloquia of the AGs. One of the colleagues in the Bill Office attended a previous one. Right, someone in the Bill's Office apparently attended one, Jimmy. So if, if they're content, are we content that, that at least a, a researcher yeah. goes? And, and if I can, I will try and attend as well. Thank you. Right. Page eight is a copy of current invitations. There aren't too many, are there? Let me see. No. Oh, yeah, that's the colloquium and European Day, which uh, obviously is right in the, the teeth of the uh, elections in May. Uh, and so, two draft minutes of our meeting of the 11th of December 2013, uh, beginning at page 10 in your packs. Are we content to agree? Agreed. Thank you. Uh, and the matters arising, page 18, a response uh, from the Department uh, to our request for sight of an internal audit report on the Victims and Survivors Service. You'll see the response states the Department do not intend to release or publish the internal uh, audit report. Any comments from members present? Well, I note, I think it was Alex Atwood who had been keen to have sight of this. We know it just. Mm -hmm. okay. Not force the department. Page 20, uh, a response from the Strategic Investment Board uh, following our request for further information on staffing costs uh, and the use of consultants. You may remember broadly, members, the SIB uh, were spending less money on consultants, but against that they were spending more money on salaries for staff. Uh, and you'll see on page 20 uh, a breakdown of salary bans for the 81 staff members. Only 21 out of the 81 uh, have a salary under £50,000. 
Sorry, Jimmy, did you indicate? Yeah. Mm. Uh, I mean, I think I asked initially questions about this. Uh, over 100k, 12 people. How long is a piece of string? Is it 199,999 pence? You know, uh, I think that's a, a recipe for. I mean, I think we should ask the question what's the individual salaries over 100k? We do not need to know who the individuals are or anything else, but I think we're dealing with public money. Mm -hmm. We need to know uh, what sort of money we're talking about. And I think on the basis of uh, consultancy that they were paying before, many of these people are consultants that have been employed mm -hmm. for Pacific in Pacific areas. Mm -hmm. uh, because you did make the point that uh, since the consultancy hand went down, the staffing costs go up. Yeah. So there's just at the end of the day no net saving as everybody else has to do uh -huh. uh, in terms of tightening belts. And uh, so, yeah, we're not going to have consultants anymore, but we'll just employ them uh, and we'll pay them out of the public purse that way. And that'll stop people asking questions about it. Uh -huh. And I don't think it's satisfactory that that table, uh, you know. Uh, even in terms of, well, the 81k to 100k, you sort of know, well, someplace in between that, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, 100k could be close to 200,000, and I really do think we need to ask the specific questions on that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I have the impression from memory that uh, a previous chief executive was one of the highest paid public servants in the UK. Well, I think one of the highest paid public servants in the UK is what is going to be the former uh, chief executive of TransLink, but uh, mm, uh, uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, that was just short of 200k, mm -hmm. uh, right? So, I mean, I, it's just a question I think we have to ask and, and, and probe into these things mm -hmm. because yeah. I think we're being sort of, oh, we'll feed them that and uh, they'll ask any more questions about it. Not good enough. No. I also think, Jimmy, they, they've moved away from consultants, but they've introduced this, this term, associate strategic advisors. Yeah. I wonder if that means they're moving away from one-off mm -hmm. fees for specific projects to putting people on retainers. So it is, it is some time, members, since we've had a, a briefing yeah. and a session with the Strategic Investment Board. Uh, and given their significance, uh, could I suggest that as well as addressing the specifics uh, that Jimmy's raising and ask for those in a briefing paper that we invite the SIB uh, to come and talk to us about their work and their plans. I like those answers ahead. Yes, 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 sorry, yes, yes, you, you want a briefing paper in advance including, yeah, yeah, including those breakdowns? Those breakdowns because mm -hmm. I think it's important that we, we would be able then to ask people mm -hmm. questions in relation to it. That's right. <coughs> All, all content that we, we ask for a session with SIB? Okay. okay. Thank you, members. Uh, yes, sorry, just to note, it was um, January 2012, I think, was the last briefing from, from SIB, so I think it's timely to go again. Uh, page 25, next members, uh, we have a response from the Committee for the Environment, advising it will keep the uh, OFMDFM committee advised of any issue uh, regarding the Commissioner's role uh, that emerges during its scrutiny of the local government bill. Uh, are we content to note? Yeah. Page 29, copy of correspondence, uh, this time from the Committee for Finance and Personnel, giving us an update uh, on budget 2015-16 processes. Again, I would suggest, are we content to note? Page 45, uh, copy of correspondence from the Committee for Finance and Personnel, again, this time in relation to outstanding post-project evaluations, uh, and I think we should be happy to note the Department has no outstanding PPEs. Uh, page 54, copy of correspondence from the Committee for the Environment, advising of its intention uh, to carry out an inquiry into wind energy. Uh, the aim of the inquiry is to identify key issues arising from the generation of renewable energy by onshore wind turbines and also to assess the adequacy of existing planning guidance uh, to address these issues. The Committee of Environment is seeking comments on the inquiry by 28th uh, of February. Any members keen to 
contribute to uh, a commentary for the department, for the committee? Jimmy. Well, it came up in my committee in a briefing in relation to, I'm, I'm just worried about wind farms going on to <coughs> strategic sites. And in a briefing <coughs> that we received, and I'm using this as an example, Chair, uh, in relation to Northern Ireland water property, in relation to the Silent Valley, there was a suggestion in a document that the Silent Valley area could be used uh, for wind farm. Now, I have to say, everybody around the table was horrified that mm. an area of natural exactly. scenic beauty would be destroyed, and that came right around the board. Yeah. Sorry, Jimmy, I, I just think I probably need to declare I am an owner of a wind turbine. No, well, a uh, wind turbine, I'm not talking about yeah, it. I know, but, but just, I'm just talking about areas yeah. of, of, sure. of strategic yeah. Yeah. importance, uh, you know, um, particularly if it's on a site of land owned by a department. Mm. It's just mm -hmm. suppose OFMDFM is an overarching interest. So I'm putting that marker down yeah. in terms of, uh, you know, we could get into awful trouble uh, with sites being ruined as a result of something mm -hmm. like that happening. Yeah. Now, we got an assurance to say no, it wouldn't happen. But that didn't allow for the fact it was still on, on, a, on a document, a consultation document. And should we check to ascertain whether there is a, an executive wide policy <coughs> with regard to wind farms? Uh, on government property, or whether it is left to individual departments and ministers, are you aware, Jimmy? Of, uh, of uh, I'm aware. You know, in, in, in briefings, obviously, questions were then asked to Northern Ireland Water in relation to their sites. Now, it transpired off the top of my head that Northern Ireland Water didn't have uh, any plans to look at anything like that, particularly in the Southern Valley area. But it strikes me that it might well happen in other areas that may well be owned by mm -hmm. uh, government. government. Uh, you can just see the criticism that would crop yep. up. Well, yeah. members content with right to the department and ask if there's an overarching executive policy or whether it's left to individual ministers and departments as a, as a first step. Agreed. Agreed. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much. Page 56, members, a couple of correspondence from the Committee for Enterprise, Trade and Investment uh, to the department in relation to its renewable uh, energy inquiry, and I suggest we just note. In which case, page uh, 58 is next. A copy of a Save the Children report uh, entitled Too Young to Fail. Uh, it's on closing the education achievement gap uh, in Northern Ireland. The Committee for Education uh, has also received a copy of the report. So are we content to note? Yeah. Yeah. Page 64 uh, is next. A copy of December's Investment Strategy Investing Activity Report. Uh, you note very little uh, activity reported for OFM, DFM. Any, any comments? If not, page 67. A copy of correspondence from the Business Office advising the annual report and accounts for 2012-13 for ILEX uh, have been laid. The committee office has one copy of the document, uh, so if members wish to see it, uh, please contact uh, the committee office. Uh, we content to note the ILEX report. Thank you. Next, members, we move to tabled uh, on page three. Uh, page three. Uh, page three is copy of a response from the Department to the Committee's request for a briefing on the policy options <coughs> arising from the uh, review of the Attorney General's Office. The response advises the Department does not think it appropriate for officials to provide a briefing uh, at this time. And that, members, is in our forward work programme, but obviously not for much longer. Any comments? No. In that case, members, uh, at page six of your tabled papers, page six. Yeah. Page four. 
been... It's the list of outstanding issues. Yeah. Is it the electronic page number so or the paper page number? So it, it's um, it's tabled. The same. Yeah, but is it the electronic number here because it's page... Four? Six. Is it six? But yeah. on the Sorry. table pa pa <coughs> page six, you get the tabled items, section 11. It's it's the one it, it it's the page that starts from Shona outstanding committee issues is the subject. That's electronic page three and nothing. Right, right. Well, I'm just making it. Okay. Yes. I think I think it is I think it is page it? three, electronic and hard copy. So uh, you will note members we have now stretched to three pages uh, of outstanding issues uh, covering three different calendar years now because we're into 2014 and it starts in 2012. There we are. Got it. Thank you. So, members, our first uh, substantive bit of business today is a briefing from the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission. Uh, this is on its annual statement for 2013. Uh, the statement was published on the 10th of December last. Mm -hmm. uh, back to your regular pack, on page 69 is Clark's brief, and the statement itself is available from page 71. Yes, there is a shortcut. <coughs> So we are joined by David Russell, yes. Afternoon. Virginia McVeigh and Good John day. Corey. Hi. Colin Cockey, yes, no? Yes. Yeah, hi. Yes. Up to you, John. Just being modest. <laughs> okay, well, you're all very welcome. Thank you. Uh, John, are you making the opening comments? Yes, I'll make the opening in comments. Your, in uh, your own time, thank Chairman, you. Chairman, um, thank you. Uh, to begin with, uh, can I say that the Human Rights Commission uh, very much welcomes <coughs> and is grateful uh, for this opportunity to discuss the uh, committee's, what is our second published annual statement. Um, you will be aware uh, this 2013 annual statement was published on International Human Rights Day on the 10th of December, uh, when we were kindly hosted uh, here uh, in Parliament buildings by the Speaker. Uh, Mr. William Hay, and uh, indeed our return here today through this type of engagement with this committee um, to us is an inherent part of the annual statement process that we're engaged in. In the opening remarks, what I intend saying, uh, first of all, is just to, just to say something in terms of the purpose of the annual statement process, uh, very briefly. Uh, but secondly, then, I would like to refer to some of the key human rights issues that are covered in the statement, uh, along with some comments on where we consider uh, good progress has been made, uh, but also where we believe, unfortunately, uh, that uh, further progress is required. Uh, and engaging with the committee, uh, Chairman, I have to state for the record that the Commission does so in accordance with the Northern Ireland Act 1998 uh, and our statutory duty to advise the Northern Ireland Assembly uh, of legislative and other measures that ought to be taken to protect human rights. Now, the, uh, just on the annual statement process, uh, it is not a report on the Commission's work uh, as per se. What it is instead is, uh, and the committee members may recall this from last year, this is intended to be a contemporaneous record of the state of human rights in Northern Ireland. Uh, this is the Human Rights Commission's assessment of how human rights are being promoted and protected in Northern Ireland in 2013. And the objective is to establish a mechanism that provides the Northern Ireland Assembly, uh, provides government, and indeed every Northern Ireland Executive Department uh, with an important annual measure of their performance on delivering human rights. Uh, this approach is a model of best practice across national human rights institutions across Europe uh, and indeed on a global basis. Uh, the Commission's assessment of developments during 2013 
is premised on the requirements of domestic uh, human rights standards and the treaty obligations the of the United Nations and Council of Europe instruments that have been ratified by the government of the UK. That's, that's, guides, that's our uh, guidance for all that we do. Uh, and in assessing compliance with international human rights standards, uh, the Commission also takes account of the findings of international monitoring bodies uh, that are directed or otherwise applied to Northern Ireland, as well as general comments and other interpretive texts from these bodies. And it's for this reason uh, uh, that the statement is structured around uh, human rights laws and standards, if you've examined the document. If you look at the contents pages of the annual statement, uh, you will see a, a very wide range indeed of human rights issues have been of concern in 2013. Uh, more than 50, in fact, if you take the trouble to count these. And these engage uh, civil, political, economic, social and cultural rights. And the message from the Commission in when we published this annual statement, and still the message today, uh, is that human rights have to be central to the development of policies and measures to address and resolve the issues that confront us in Northern Ireland. And I'm just going to comment on a few of those issues uh, in this and then allow time then uh, for engagement with uh, my colleagues and yourselves. Um, first of all, our news is dominated uh, by the issues addressed by Dr Haas and the all-party participants. Uh, and as recorded in the statement last summer and autumn, uh, this commission prioritised the completion uh, of a number of substantive papers uh, on the display of flags, symbols and emblems, uh, parades and protests, uh, dealing with Northern Ireland's past towards a traditional justice approach, uh, plus uh, a separate paper on the human right to culture in post-conflict societies. And the <coughs> centrality of human rights was at the heart of these submissions, uh, which the Commission presented to Dr Haas uh, at the start of his consultation process, and of course, which we shared uh, with all the political parties. Uh, and we have noted as a Commission that uh, our submissions are reflected in a number of areas of the proposed uh, agreement paper. And uh, we would say the concerted efforts made by all uh, to deal with the past parades and flags are welcomed by the Human Rights Commission. Uh, and we believe it remains imperative that the issues are dealt with and that political resolution is achieved in 2014. Uh, and for example, uh, on that point, uh, following the examination of the UK in 2013, uh, the United Nations Committee Against Torture has requested an update on how the past is being addressed in Northern Ireland. And this report uh, is due for consideration by the UN Committee in May. So these issues are not just uh, are of interest to human rights on a wider basis than Northern Ireland. And uh, Chairman, I would like to confirm here uh, just that the Commission is willing to continue to offer advice uh, to those continuing to work towards achieving agreement on these difficult issues. And the Commission did engage with Dr Haas and his team, uh, and we will continue to engage uh, where uh, our advice is being sought. And it would also be remiss of me uh, not to add here that the Commission also advised Dr Haas that a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland is justifiable and would have benefit for the issues that he was addressing. And I would re reiterate here uh, the call for all parties to give priority to progressing the process that would result in a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. And again, I wish to state here clearly for the record, the Commission would welcome further engagement uh, with all parties or with relevant committees on this issue. If I could turn to just some other matters, uh, in the annual statement in 2012, the Commission reported on a number of areas that required action by the Northern Ireland Executive, uh, and some of these received welcome attention, but we have to say, unfortunately, others didn't. Uh, with on 
to, to, to sort of take positive aspects first. Uh, on disability, the Commission noted the publication of the disability strategy, uh, which is a welcome measure in addressing obligations under the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Disabled Persons. Next, the long-standing issue of imprisonment of women alongside male offenders was acknowledged by the Minister of Justice and a commitment was made to establish a separate self-contained custodial facility for women prisoners in Northern Ireland. In the year ahead, however, given the extent of the issues in the prison estate and the length of time that reform has been outstanding, uh, the Commission would say here that it is of crucial importance that the commitments that have been given have to be delivered by action on the ground. Similarly, the move to ensure that children are no longer held with adult prisoners in Hyde Bank Wood is welcomed, uh, and the joint progress made by both the Minister for Justice and the Minister for Education to ensure full access to the Northern Ireland curriculum for children in detention is a positive matter. During the year, we also uh, saw initiatives aimed at protecting vulnerable and marginalised groups. For example, the ongoing work to update the law in Northern Ireland relating to mental capacity and health and the proposed human trafficking and exploitation bill have at their core a desire to demonstrate commitment to human rights. Uh, and the Commission would look forward to these important measures uh, being adopted by the Assembly in 2014. Unfortunately, on a less positive uh, aspect, the Commission uh, is reporting on a number of areas where outstanding matters remain to be addressed, uh, despite these having been raised in the Commission's 2012 annual statement. For example, there is no single, there's still no single legislative instrument to consolidate, strengthen and clarify existing equality protections in Northern Ireland. Uh, and this means that this jurisdiction therefore continues to lag behind other parts of the UK in terms of equality law. There are also too many persons still imprisoned for failure to pay a fine. And from April 2012 to April 2013, there were 1,700 receptions into custody in Northern Ireland for non-payment of fines. And this is indeed a 30% increase compared to the previous 12 months. So the situation deteriorated in this respect in 2013. Similarly, there continues, we believe, to be too many prisoners held on demand, on remand. During 2013, remand prisoners accounted for 31% of the prison population. And while the Commission notes proposals for reform of bail law and for the development of alternative bail arrangements for children, this also continues to be <coughs> of concern to us. Further, in Northern Ireland, the age of criminal responsibility continues to be 10 years old. And it is the case that the United Nations once again called for this to be increased uh, in 2013, when the UK was examined by the Committee Against Torture. If I could move on to, uh, again, a difficult issue we recognise, and that's on termination of pregnancy. Uh, this received considerable attention during 2013. Uh, the Department of Health consulted on draft guidelines on this matter, uh, and the Commission advised that the draft, if implemented, would fail to comply with the European Convention on Human Rights. The matter was also considered, this matter was also considered during the uh, examination of the UK by the United Nations Committee for the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. Uh, and it will be a focus uh, of review again by this committee this year. So we're saying as a commission that issue uh, needs to be resolved. And the commission has advised that compliance with human rights laws and standards requires termination, requires that termination should be made available in Northern Ireland in cases of rape, incest, and serious malformation of the uh, fetus. Equal equality on grounds of sexual orientation remains a matter of concern as well. 
it's unfortunate that during 2013, this Commission had to engage uh, its legal powers to ensure that the law uh, governing eligibility to be considered as an adoptive parent was compliant with the European Convention on Human Rights. The Commission was, was also disappointed that judicial review was necessary with regard to eligibility for blood donations. And the Commission further noted that the exclusion of Northern Ireland fr from the provisions of the same-sex marriage bill are all aspects that we consider are not uh, in keeping with human rights requirements. My final comments, Chairman, uh, deal with uh, a wider issue of compliance with treaty obligations and the Northern Ireland Executive fulfilling its reporting duties. In 2012, the Northern Ireland Executive failed to fully engage in the United Nations Human Rights Council's universal periodic review process. And this failure, unfortunately, to engage in the international human rights system was repeated in 2013, when the Northern Ireland Executive again failed to contribute to the United Kingdom State Report uh, to the UN Human Rights Committee and the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights. And this failure was criticised by the UK government. Now, these failures are a concern to this Commission. Uh, we will say that Northern Ireland has much that is good to report with regard to human rights uh, protections. Uh, so it is of vital importance that the government, the Northern Ireland Executive, can demonstrate its commitment by fully engaging in these relevant reporting processes in the United Nations systems. In 2014, uh, the optional protocol on the sale of children, child prostitution and pornography will be examined for the first time. And we're saying that this provides an opportunity for Northern Ireland to benefit from international experience and expertise. And I want to say that the Commission would advise here today that this committee should consider uh, and make a standing commitment to overseeing the adequacy of reporting on such obligations by the Northern Ireland Executive. Uh, it's a proposition uh, that we would put uh, by way of advice to you. And last, to close, uh, Chairman, I think it is important that I repeat a point I made when we published a statement. Uh, the Human Rights Commission in Northern Ireland, as a national human rights institution, uh, has no desire to have to meet our responsibilities or to be conducting our relationship with the Assembly and Northern Ireland departments through the courts. We have no desire to have to do that. Instead, I wish to be clear that the Commission's desire and, in fact, our policy and strategy is to work cooperatively and positively with all to progress human rights. And that's what we look forward to being able to continue to do in 2014 uh, with the Northern Ireland Assembly, uh, with the Assembly committees, which are an important part of the, uh, the human rights uh, aspects from our perspective, and with departments. And those are my opening remarks, I think. Uh, we'll give time now for uh, colleague or for assembly committee members to ask questions and for my colleagues to contribute their expertise. Okay, John, thank you very much. I, I found that useful and comprehensive. I'd like to begin where, where you finished because you clearly stated your your preference to work collaboratively with um, uh, with the devolved institutions, but but clearly within that uh, by mentioning uh, the legal route, you presumably reserve such a right. Uh, if you feel that is the only option to discharge your legal responsibilities as an organisation. Are we close to a legal uh, route in any area? Well, uh, we are constantly considering uh, legal routes and options in respect of the range of human rights issues. Now, let my colleagues pick up the detail of it. But uh, what I say is that uh, as a Human Rights Commission and as uh, an accredited A-status national human rights institution within the United Nations system, we have to be true to our responsibilities in that regard. And, and that really is to call uh, in respect of human rights without fear or favour. 
if, if we consider that a human rights standard is not being complied with, uh, or if there's a violation, or if there's an abuse, we have to call that, and we have to act accordingly within the resources that are available to the Commission, because that's always a factor in what we can do or not do. So on a, as a broad answer, I could never say to you, this is at the point of litigation, or this is not at the point of litigation. Uh, but there are issues where uh, we would always have to reserve our capacity to litigate. But I do have my colleagues wish to come back in <coughs> more specific terms. No, there are, there are issues under discussion, as with the broad spectrum of all the 50, for example, that John has referred to in the annual statement. There are always areas of law that are being challenged in, in many quarters. And as you will know, members of the public can approach us at any time. We uh, have legal clinics, uh, and the application can be made to us for legal assistance. But in broad terms, the answer to your question, Chair, is no. Because in broad terms, the vast majority of the work that the Commission is doing at the minute is in terms of assistance and advice. A couple of examples that I can throw out which relate to the work that's captured in the annual statement would be in relation to the flags, symbols and emblems publication and in relation to the parades paper. Uh, we have agreed with the Chief Constable that we will provide training this year for senior PSNI staff to assist them because of the value that we added that was seen in the advice that we provided. We also have a service level agreement with the Health and Social Care Board, uh, and at present we are helping them in relation to uh, review work around vulnerable adults. And we have a service level agreement with the Northern Ireland Ombudsman. And one of the issues you know that the Ombudsman is looking at in relation to new powers is standards and local councils. So across the board, our approach is to assist training for the DOJ, uh, training for other departments, DSO. Uh, so Close, well, we await whatever applications come to us from the public. The issues of public concern are already before you and documented in the statement. Okay. I'm, I'm sure we will, we will soon get into some of the issues that have been in the, the public domain over the last number of weeks. I have a particular interest um, declarant um, sitting on the All Party Group on uh, UNSCR 1325 and the Convention for the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. Uh, it doesn't seem to be going that well in Northern Ireland. Would that be your assessment? Well, we have uh, made representations at the uh, hearing just before Christmas. There are fundamental difficulties in this jurisdiction in terms of um, the basis on which Special Resolution 1325 operates in a jurisdiction, in terms of um, the definition of the conflict that has taken place. But there are always opportunities in any jurisdiction to be um, innovative. As to, as to the approach that can be taken to try and bring in some of the standards expected. And so we had given evidence there. It's about women in public life, uh, women in the judiciary, and support for women post-conflict. Uh, but also CEDAW goes into those difficult territories that you have alluded to, so for example in relation to issues around termination. And although we have a ruling, generally a four-year cycle, with the international bodies looking at Northern Ireland, on two key issues they have said, we're actually coming back early. We're going to come back early in relation to looking for a, an infrastructure for dealing with the past. That's the uh, Committee Against Torture, May 2014. And we're going to come back early under CEDAW in May 2014 in relation to termination of pregnancy, specifically for Northern Ireland. Uh, Bronwyn, Bronwyn McGowan. Thank you for your, your presentation. Um, just regarding the outstanding issue of the Single Equality Bill, have you been discussing this issue with, with the Department? And secondly as well, could you tell me in a practical way, if, if that was implemented, how it, how it would enhance equality protections here in the North? I think, I think the argument has been that we're nearly I think it's 40 years of equality legislation spread across. So the argument over many years, which will hardly be rocket science for me to repeat, is the issue around harmonising. And if you harmonise law and put it into one location, the general view is in terms of human rights, you increase the accessibility and the likelihood of a remedy for members of the public, as opposed to all these disparate pieces of legislation. And there were also concerns around age and sexual orientation in particular, so those were the key concerns. Um, 
We continue to raise the issue of um, single equality legislation and liaise with the Equality Commission around that. There, there are a range of changes uh, brought in in Britain, and I, I, we haven't come prepared in that particular dimension. Certainly, I haven't uh, by the uh, UK Single Equality Bill, but I think. Uh, and the Equality Commission uh, is, an issue, is an issue that they have uh, mm -hmm. advocated. But I think in, in, uh, one of the underlying points is that uh, we now have our equality laws, our anti-discrimination laws, spread over uh, a wide range of statutory instruments. Uh, and it's, it's, it's really uh, a process of establishing a single equality bill, as they've been able to do in the UK, would mean that all of these laws are brought up to date. On your precise question, you know, what fundamental difference would this make in terms of an individual? Uh, now, we believe there are issues around age discrimination mm -hmm. that are, are not provided for in the same way uh, because of the, the difference in legislative models. But we think that Northern Ireland would just benefit from having its equality laws brought entirely up to date uh, to equate with whatever, all the provisions that are now in the UK Equality Bill, or the, the Equality Bill in Britain, that has not been taken forward here. And it just makes, we just think it, I just personally, and as a personal view, makes good legislative sense mm. to bring our equality laws together, because there are an awful lot of similarities in the areas concerned. Okay. Do you take a view then on, on the proposal for an Equality and Good Relations Commission? I would say it's not a matter that we as a commission has formally considered no. uh, as such. Um, the, uh, it's not a question of, uh, I think it's the simplest answer is we have not formally considered it. Um, and I think I would prefer to leave it at that until we, until we do so. We're also having regard to the fact that the Equality Commission, uh, as a separate uh, statutory body, uh, is uh, examining this issue as well. And we work closely with the Equality Commission. Mm. There are three areas where we have provided advice, though, in relation to the flag symbols and emblems paper, the parades paper, and the mm. right to culture. We refer to the importance of taking cognizance and giving legislative effect um, on the ground, as it were, then, uh, to good relations, uh, the issue of tolerance, uh, mutual respect, and understanding is a key human rights principle. Uh, and in those papers, we document how that can be applied in the decision-making processes. And how, how would you characterise the, the, the introduction of good relations, you know, thinking back to 40 years ago when the focus was appeared to be exclusively on, on the other side of the fence? Uh, yeah, David. Uh, there's a number of international standards. <clears throat> the language isn't good relations, but it talks about state duty in terms of promoting mutual respect, mm. understanding, and tolerance. Mm. So it's captured within Article 29, for example, the Convention on the Rights of the Child. There's a similar provision in the Framework Convention, protection of national minorities. There's similar soft law standards as well, and European Court jurisprudence. So whilst the language of human rights isn't good relations, the spirit of what good relations captures in terms of domestic legislation you will find in human rights law. And the same thing goes to your previous question. There's human rights standards and soft law guidance around the creation of institutions of state that will promote equality and good relations, but it's not prescriptive as to what that would look like. Okay, thank you. Megan Fair. It's just um, actually to pick up on the Chair's point earlier about um, UN Resolution 1325, and obviously you know the British Prime Minister has absolutely no plans to implement it in the North, but the fact remains we have inexcusably low levels of female representation across the board in public life. Um, and I'm sure the media and their portrayal and the disseminating and the limited portrayals of, that they do of women across the board has a huge impact on that. And I think we only have to look at the way Megan O'Sullivan was treated when she was here. I'm not really sure what her PhD has to do with her shoes, but that's maybe something that our local journalists can dwell on. But um, in the absence of that resolution being implemented, do you, do you feel gender quotas would have a positive impact on life here? We haven't. We haven't requested uh, gender quotas, but we were aware um, 
prior to the hearing just before Christmas that I think it's the Foreign and Commonwealth Office had uh, drafted a set of proposals for different post-conflict jurisdictions across the world. And I thought it was very telling that some of the programmes and policies that they were coming up with for other jurisdictions, there was no reason why that kind of thought process in terms of encouraging representation and increasing representation couldn't be um, thought through, discussed and applied in other places without necessarily having to grasp the nettle that um, there seemed to be a, um, a real difficulty in grasping. Yeah, just another um, question, basically just around what effects do you think um, that the, 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 the sorry the delay in coming forward with the sexual orientation strategy and an all-inclusive um, piece of anti-discrimination legislation on the basis of age for good facilities and services is having on people's human rights here in the north and have you had any engagement with the department around those issues? Well, on sexual orientation we have. Um, we didn't bring the judicial review in relation to blood donation, but um, we were aware of that tract and it's referred to in the annual statement and in relation to issues around um, the possibility of being considered as a, an adoptive parent. So yes, we're very much engaged with those. In relation to age, um, we had our report on um, dignity in nursing homes, so it connected to goods, facilities and services in relation to what, what was the experience of people on the ground. So those are the practical things that we have been involved in to date. Chris Little, Deputy Chair. Thanks, Chair. Thank you for your presentation. The, it's obviously a dense report, covers a wide range of issues and it's extremely helpful. I'm working my way through it and hopefully is you suggested uh, it can be ongoing task for the committee to engage with these issues and with the executive reporting on the issues. Um, I find the papers on flags and emblems and parades and protests extremely helpful as well. Is, would you make any particular comment in, in relation to those papers, maybe the flags and emblems in particular, in terms of what types of findings or recommendations you would make in relation to those issues from a human rights perspective? Well, I, I'll just make a couple of general points in response to that, and then colleagues can pick up on, on detail. Uh, the Flags and Emblems paper in particular, uh, as it uh, st says clearly at the start, is intended to be a technical paper uh, to aid decision makers. Uh, it wasn't making comments one way or other, uh, but it was intended to be a technical paper for decision makers who have to make decisions about uh, deciding to fly a flag uh, and there were a range of decision makers covered in the advice. Um, and what it set out to do was to set out uh, what the Commission's best assessment was of all the relevant human rights standards, uh, both uh, any, uh, human rights law uh, and soft law standards that would apply uh, in making those decisions. It wasn't a comment uh, one way or the other. Mm -hmm. So that, that's. That's what it was aimed to do, and that was the purpose of it. Uh, and to be available, therefore, to all the uh, organisations and statutory bodies who have to consider <coughs> the issue of flags. And that's, that was the extent of it, and that was the purpose of it. But if other colleagues wish to add any points uh, to that. It was a decision-making process in um, all three situations. We'd identified a private person in a private space, a private person in a public space, and then public authorities on uh, public spaces. But essentially, the decision-making process ended up uh, largely the same. And then in relation to uh, parades, it was a different kind of process where we recognised we had both a resolution by dialogue opportunity and then an adjudicatory body. So it was a different style of a document, which is interesting because that is essentially the, um, the, the core of the Haas model. But it, it was really designed to be an aid to decision-making process on a human rights basis. Okay. okay. Thank you. Alex Maskey. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you again for your your presentation and your reports. Um, I remember last year the, uh, the Commission were here and you were making it very clear that you were very much at variance with the, the position that the Executive had adopted or had not adopted. Uh, so I thought that was actually a very important uh, position to, for yourself to adopt, so you were quite clear. You know, we're, we're basically marking the card here that what you expect to be done by way of protection of human rights is not being done, and you made that very clear. 
and I thought that was actually quite an important uh, intervention on your behalf. So, uh, I've kind of two questions. One's a more simple one. In terms of the report, I think you released it last October around racist, racist hate crime. I think there were a number 29 or 30 recommendations coming out of that. And I think why it's just largely down to the Department of Justice to take some of this forward. But you did say you had discussions with the OFM, part of the, with the Justice Department as well. So, I wonder if you give us a wee bit of insight into and, uh, how those discussions have went so far and what you maybe hope to get from that, but obviously as it particularly relates to OFM role in any uh, implementation of those recommendations. That's the first part, so we'll come back second after that, if you mind. Well, as you say, the Department of Justice has taken the lead in uh, forming what they call very importantly a delivery group instead of just a working group. OFM, DFM is a part of that working group and I understand that um, DOJ and OFM, DFM are having discussions around which recommendations fall um, to whom. Uh, but the delivery group has worked very well so far. Uh, we have been with them in a series of meetings and out of that um, training has been requested by the Probation Board for Northern Ireland, the Public Prosecution Service, PSNI, and some of that training has already been delivered. So very positive responses, and um, as you identify, it's absolutely vital um, that OFM, DFM plays its part in that in responding on um, behalf of the executive in terms of some of the recommendations made. Could I ask? I mean, you might not want to offer an opinion, but I mean, uh, some of these things are so long and the ongoing, like hate, hate, hate crime and so on, and racism, sectarianism. So hate crime is uh, has been a fortunate feature of our life here. And I actually be a bit concerned when, on the back of a report that you produce, that, that organisations seem to be uncommon forward saying, "Yes, let's do some training." I mean, why is it not ingrained in their DNA that they would do that? And I meant Tommy, I mean, Jimmy and I, for example, were on the, the policing board for together, so the police knew quite well that they needed to do training. So why do they need to wait until you produce a report, or the DOJ, or any other department of that matter? It just concerns me that it nearly relies on a report by yourselves to trigger somebody or some agency to say, oh, fine, we'll do some training. And I'm glad that they're doing that. But bring me the core point of what I want to make is that really, uh, and it is really in, in terms of the relationship between your commission and these institutions. Um, and yes, you do you want to work very much, and you do work very much in collaboration with people in the partnership. But I mean, I would like to see the relationship in a way with a bit of a, a step change in terms of because we've just noted a report early on of outstanding issues, which is you know sexual orientation strategies. Equality matters, which are ongoing and will be ongoing till we're sitting here blue in the face, perhaps. Um, so, at what point would your commission think that? I mean, I'm I'm inviting you to be more proactively coming here and marking the colour. Basically, that's my point. So, I mean, would you have a view that uh, after a certain period of time that you are going through the partnership and the collaboration and the cajoling and the persuasion route that you'll say, let's call time here and let's get something done. I know it's not easy. Well, we've, we've had to do that, unfortunately, for example, in relation to adoption. Uh, in terms of limited resources that we have and the public interest, the best way, obviously, is through dialogue and advice. But as you say, quite rightly, there comes a point where, in terms of protection of human rights, that's no longer um, the best route forward. And we had very good judgments at the Court of First Instance and then the Court of Appeal in relation to the adoption legislation. So um, uh, I would say that that does need to be done. Um, uh, obviously, increased resources would help us do more, but uh, litigation is a route that's very important. And that's why it's in the Paris <coughs> Principles and National Human Rights Institutions have to have it, because it's well recognised across the world that, that life is a carrot and stick approach very often. Um, coming back to your first point in relation to training, um, I very much take your point uh, to be fair to the authorities involved, uh, a core value added by our report was the identification of an issue that hadn't been fully recognised before. And that's largely what the training relates to, which is uh, when um, the police and then the PPS were moving through a, f a criminal file, they had an option of two ways to move forward. Uh, one was that they could, in effect, prove the intent 
there was an intent of race hate, or the other was they could prove that um, that was shown, it was demonstrated by the language, and it's usually language used. And what was happening was, by going and trying to prove intent, they were making life very hard for themselves, and we were ending up, we think, as a result, with very few prosecutions. So the key in terms of the training is to look at um, why don't we and how could we uh, go on the basis of what's being clearly said or demonstrated at the time of, very often it's a, an attack, it's an offence against the person, uh, crime. So why don't you use that? Because it would make it a lot easier, then we would see the prosecutions, then trust would grow within the community. So the training is quite specific as well as broadening it out. Thank you, Phil. Could I say, I mean, I agree with the core point that you're making uh, in the sense of, uh, you know, government departments should be doing these things without the Human Rights Commission beating them into doing it. And, and you know, in reality, that's what should be happening. And I think we would say that's correct. State party is responsible for compliance uh, with all human rights. The task of the Commission as I see it, certainly, is to embed human rights in this society. And we have a number of instruments for seeking to do that within the limited resources. But uh, to take uh, the, the point that uh, Mr. Maske is making, uh, we recognise as a commission that if we can uh, imbue and embed within uh, the government departments, uh, policy makers and those responsible, human rights uh, approaches to issues, that will go a long way. And in fact, and the committee may be aware and it's recorded in the statement, that is actually happening because uh, with the assistance of funding from Atlantic Philanthropies, we have developed, uh, in cooperation with the Northern Ireland Civil Service, a very extensive human rights training programme with over a thousand mm -hmm. civil servants participating in this. At this point in time, and that is, will be extended to other areas in the health sector, and so on. So, you know, the the principle behind what you're saying is one that we uh, fully subscribe to. Thank you, John. Okay. Uh, a couple of points to conclude, if I may, John. First of all, uh, in the news this week, the historical institutional abuse uh, inquiry. Um, as you are aware, it is restricted to institutional abuse. There are two issues to my mind, the Magdalen Laundries, and, and we're awaiting the department coming back, uh, having scoped the possibilities there. And then there's the bigger issue of non-institutional abuse, if I may put it that way. Others would, would call it clerical abuse, certainly abuse that took place outside of the institutions. Do you take a view on uh, what should or should not be done for those who are not within the tent? of this inquiry who claim they have been abused? We had liaised in relation to the terms of reference and the setup of the inquiry, and um, one point that came to mind was the extension of the time reference after uh, dialogue with ourselves. I think the, um, the time period of the inquiry was extended, but as you are probably aware, uh, the uh, the Committee for the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women had looked at the issue and also CAT, and they were interested and referred directly to the issue of the Magdalene Laundries. Some work seemed to have been done on various Magdalene Laundry style institutions that m may well have been in the north. It's quite difficult to find the records and whatnot, but some research has been done, and certainly the CEDAW Committee was very keen to um, press on that point. Um, in relation to clerical abuse, I'm trying to remember if they said anything. We, um, <coughs> no, the committees themselves didn't, but at the time, whenever the inquiry was being set up, the Commission did provide advice to the committee. Mm -hmm. And um, the then Chief Commissioner, Professor O'Flaherty, was asked that same question about the extension of the remit, potentially, of the inquiry. And the view at the time was that it wouldn't obviously be for the Commission to say that that would necessarily be the route through which the issue could be addressed. But in terms of the victims, there's a human right there in terms of redress for those victims, including those who are outside the current scope of the inquiry. So you're correct in what you're suggesting. There is a need for the state to address the matter. Right. So there is a human rights imbalance as currently as we currently stand. 
Well, to the extent that there's victims there at the minute that have no mechanism yeah. of redress, there's a, an ongoing human rights issue that needs to be addressed. Ah, but the argument is those who are outside the, the, the ambit of, of Stranley Hart's process uh, can go to the police and or the social services. Does that, in your view, cover it? Well, I think we know from, if we look at other historical matters in Northern Ireland, that these things are much more complex than suggesting that the only avenue open to victims is to go directly to the PSNI. Uh, on and, and maybe just to complete the point, uh, if, uh, if your colleagues wish to turn to page 24 of the annual statement, uh, my, uh, the Chief Commissioner, Professor Michael Flaherty, that David has referred to, uh, emphasised, and it's quoted, all victims of child sexual abuse are entitled to justice, redress and accountability, and all perpetrators of that abuse should face the consequence. And I think uh, that is a, a statement of the Commission's position. Right, that's page 95 of your electronic PACS members. It, okay. it is a clear statement, but, but how you achieve it remains yeah, a matter well, of... From my knowledge of human rights, it, it does not specify that you, okay. you only use one you, sure. you have to only use one mechanism to achieve these things. Mm -hmm. on, uh, on the question of language, which of course became an issue during the, the process uh, that, w that was Dr. Hass's uh, initiative, um, there is contested language. I'd like to ask, it was page 18 of your report. Um, you have a paragraph, rule of law, uh, colon, non-state actors. Do you... Do you receive any complaints about the use of phrases such as non-state actors? Page 89, members of your electronic facts. We haven't, to my knowledge, received any complaints formally about the use of the language, but in all of our engagement with communities across Northern Ireland, um, uh, the issue of language constantly c comes up and how we are to refer to certain groups of people is, is a matter that's constantly in debate. Um, and even within the Commission itself, uh, over uh, all three uh, Commission boards, as it were, these, these are matters that have been uh, discussed as, as a good pluralistic board would do. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm asking purely for my own information. I mean, when you use an expression like non-state actor, do you feel you know, conscious that this may cause offence with some sections of our community? Right. Yeah. We appreciate that there are many difficult and sensitive issues in this community. The Commission uses the language of human rights, and the language of human rights includes uh, state actors, non-state state actors, combatants, ex-combatants, and so on. And that's the language of human rights, and that's what the Commission will use. And we can't resile from using the language of human rights, laws and standards, protocols and conventions at all. That's not to say that we do not recognise there are sensitivities. Absolutely. So Alex Atwood wants to come in. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Um, the first thing is that, uh, just dealing with the point previously made by the Chair in relation to historical institutional child abuse. Couldn't provide a copy of the CAP committee report in that regard, uh, because you do refer to it, the, John has just referred to it in terms of um, an answer to the chair, Be because it does seem to me that whatever about victims, um, people who are abused outside the institutions, the CAP committee recommendation is explicit in respect of Man Magdalene Laundries. Mm -hmm. Is that the case? That the CAP committee view is that that um, prompt independent of their investigations into institutional abuse uh, certainly might capture the Magdalene Laundries and equipment institutions. Mm -hmm. I think that would be helpful in informing the committee and hopefully informing OFM DFM in terms of where this thing might go, certainly well, in regard to institutional abuse and Magdalene in particular? Well, they, they were quite specific and yeah. even um, the, the discussions that were going around when that um, committee was um, meeting uh, was all around, as I had said before, they knew about Magdalene Laundries and they'd received information about Magdalene Laundries and then there were some question marks over Magdalene Laundry type mm -hmm. institutions and um, my understanding would be that um, they would probably broaden that title to include those other institutions. That was the way the discussion was going at the time. There wasn't another collective word that they would have used, been able to use. But we can get you a copy mm -hmm. of that if you want. 
the CAT committee, as you may or may not know, um, was heavily involved in terms of the case in Ireland with regards to the Magdalene. So it has a long history itself as a committee of focusing in on this issue for scrutiny. So I think you're, you're correct. You know, the intention of the committee now is well and truly formed with regards to this, and you would expect not just in this jurisdiction but elsewhere globally, it's going to take exactly the same line from here on. The second question arising from that is that is it subject to reading the CAT committee report? Is the CAT committee report silent on the issue of um, victims of abuse in private scenarios, as is, as is the word you, that you use in your report? Is CAT silent on the issue of individual victims outside the institutions? I can't say off. I mean, in terms with regards to inhuman degrading treatment and what might constitute torture by private individuals, or as we were referring to earlier, non state actors, the CAT committee is very clear across the, the gambit, and its position would apply equally in the issue, in the issue of, of child abuse. Um, has it focused in specifically on? For example, clerical abuse outside of institutions. I don't know offhand. We'd have to look to see what it has said in other in other countries. But we could certainly find out for you and report mm -hmm. back. It would be helpful because the committee is waiting uh, on a reply from OFM DFM in terms of you know, this issue about individual victims of abuse outside the setting of an institution. Okay, we'll do that. And and obviously, given the week that's in it, and mm -hmm. uh, given your presence here, and given what the uh, the CAT committee has said previously. The second question is, I'm just arising from Alex Maskey's question, is there any other um, department of government that you have had to advise um, that what they may be proposing may be discriminatory, uh, like you did in respect of um, blood donations? In all the advice that you're given to government departments, given your responsibilities to safeguard human rights, is there anything else that you've advised or gone as far as to advise any government department at this time that the, anything they may be proposing might be discriminatory? One example of that was in relation to um, DFP, where it fell in relation to civil marriage and same sex couples and uh, the the fact of international wa law was that there was no international human rights obligation to provide but the technical uh, er outcome was that if it were to be provided in England and Wales that a difficulty would arise in Northern Ireland if it wasn't equally available here even though under international human rights law it wasn't required so that's um, but say that example. matter in blood donations, is there anything else that you advise any other government department or minister yeah. that anything they may propose might be discriminatory? Yeah, if you interpret the term discriminatory in, 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 a, in a wider sense, uh, uh, welfare reform, for example, mm -hmm. there were several aspects of that where the Commission identified potential discriminatory impact uh, in relation to human rights, uh, which we advised uh, both the uh, relevant committee and the ad hoc committee, which was something we welcomed being established. Uh, for That uh, was the first ad hoc committee on <coughs> quality and human rights that the Assembly established, and we welcomed that, and we welcomed that mechanism. But we, uh, you know, that's an example where we did identify a potential discriminatory impact. Mm -hmm. there, I mean, there are others that we could turn to, for example, um, uh, we gave advice in relation to the Armed Forces Covenant, which had issues around discrimination. We have given advice in relation to Lauren House as an immigration detention centre and some of the difficulties of identifying um, victims of torture. Uh, in relation to stop and search powers and the new code that was uh, implemented, we gave uh, advice in relation to racial profiling. So issues of discrimination will very often arise, and it may not be the number one issue, but they'll arise in a plethora of issues in, in a year. Okay, thanks so much. And the final question is, the advice that you provided in respect to the planning bill in relation to your concerns about that, do you share that advice with OFM, DFM and or the Attorney General at the time? I, I didn't catch the name of the bill. Planning, planning bill. bill. Oh, the planning bill. Yeah, I think we shared it with the OFM, DFM. I don't believe we shared it with the Attorney-General. 
You mentioned the, the military covenant. Am I right in saying your advice was that there was nothing with regard to Section 75 which would prevent the executive from implementing the military covenant if it so wished? Yes, as I recall, go ahead. Um, for that issue on Section 75, we really um, advise the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee there to seek the views of the, the Equality Commission on that, as it's not um, within our, our statutory duties as such, although we did. Um, make the point that nothing in international human rights law um, prevented the, the armed forces covenant. In fact, um, quite a bit of international human rights law discusses the obligation on the state to provide for, for members of the armed forces and to ensure and their ends. right to an adequate standard of living and very just work conditions. Okay. Well, may I thank you all very much indeed. Do you, do you publish a forward work programme? Yes, we do. But we're just preparing our next business plan. Well, we would obviously be, be interested, given the, the list of, of issues that, that John identified as yeah. outstanding or on, on the negative side of the fence. Can I thank you all very much indeed uh, for your time today? And uh, can I reciprocate, Chairman, and thank the committee for the time? And uh, I repeat, uh, we're interested in a constructive working relationship on the whole range of issues. Uh, we also have a strategic plan uh, in place from 2013 to 2016. Mm -hmm. Uh, which um, is available uh, on the Commission's website. Uh, and it's mercifully short, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> be pleased to know. Yeah, but I uh, think the, the work programme for 2014 be particularly yes, we, useful, we, John, as we and we shape ours. And we base the work programme around the strategic plan. So, yes, indeed, we'll share that. Okay, thank, thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Members, the next item uh, is to consider a written report, and uh, page 138 uh, of your electronic packs is the starting point. It's uh, the quarterly report for July to September of last year uh, of the desk officers in Brussels attached to the Barroso Task Force. Um, the four areas, just uh, to remind you, competitiveness and employment, innovation and technology, climate change and energy, uh, and social cohesion. On the latter, social cohesion, which obviously uh, falls under uh, the department as, as the lead, there were two briefing documents uh, the desk officer produced. Uh, this was in support of organisations who were applying for EU funding. Um, what I would suggest, in the absence of any other comment, which is welcome, of course, sh that we write and ask if we could have sight of those two briefing papers. Great. Any other comment? If not, uh, we move to agenda item uh, 8, which is a proposal by the Office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister to make a statutory rule under powers conferred by Articles 50 and 51 of the Fair Employment and Treatment Northern Ireland Order 1998, uh, brackets FITO. The order specifies those bodies which are to be regarded as public authorities for the purposes of Part 7 of the Fair Employment and Treatment Order, Northern Ireland, uh, 1998, brackets FITO. Amending orders are normally made on an annual basis uh, to take account of new bodies uh, being established, wind up, or whose titles uh, may well have changed. So the only proposed changes uh, are as follows. Number one, to add the Maislong Cash Development Corporation, uh, and number two, to add the Victims and Survivors Service. Uh, a copy of the correspondence from the Department can be found at page 151, and the draft statutory rule uh, is available to you on page 155. Uh, the question is, are members content to write to the Department uh, and advise that we are content with the proposed rule? Yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Deputy <laughs> Chair. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Bronwyn? Yes. Alex? Yes. And. Brief. Jimmy, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Are you agreed with the statutory rule adding the Maze Long Cash Development Corporation and the Victim yeah. Service? Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, members, page 162 is next uh, for forward work programme <coughs> for January to March of this year. Uh, the update of the programme for government uh, is scheduled for next week. I understand uh, the programme board has still not yet met, and therefore the briefing will not happen. 
I'll pause for comments, if there are any. What do you mean the programme board hasn't met, Chair? It hasn't met to review the latest status of the programme for government. So it's a quarterly progress report. It's then uh, taken on board and reviewed by the programme board. Uh, is there another step in there before? There's an oversight body. Yes, there's an oversight body of officials. So it has to go through those phases uh, before the department uh, deem it ready for discussion by committee. Uh, we're, we're several months behind. So the last one was uh, July. We're now in January. Uh, and it's hardly rocket science to suggest that the longer the gap, the less, effect, less effective the scrutiny in terms <laughs> certainly of affecting positive change. Uh, but that's where we are. The programme board has not yet met and therefore the briefing won't happen. And I, I have to say to members, it would be my impression that it could be four weeks minimum uh, before we get to scrutinise the programme for government. Uh, I would also advise on, on <laughs> briefings that may not happen as scheduled. Uh, we had asked for a departmental update on Together Building a United Community next week. Uh, but the department has indicated uh, we are all to be invited to the TBUC Design Day on United Youth, which is scheduled for Thursday the 23rd. Uh, and they would therefore like to defer the briefing uh, until after that design day uh, and are suggesting 5th of February so that they can discuss the outcomes of this, uh, this event, which is uh, Belfast City Centre, I believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's three or four or five elements of tea book, isn't there? Mm -hmm. As opposed to one? Yeah. So I, well, actually, I think there's seven. seven. We thought there were Whatever six. So they should be oh, able sorry, to that's sorry. Should you brief us on the other six then next week. I beg your pardon. Right. That, that was the signature project, so right. Well, whatever. There's numbered elements to it, so they should be able to brief us on the others, even if they feel that they have to reserve their judgment in respect to that particular element. Well, they're they're asking for the two week two week delay to to brief us on on what they obviously consider is a very important. Uh, element of the design and pre-implementation of TBOC on that specific of United Youth. Uh, do members <coughs> take a, do we take a view? Is that if you give certain people an inch, they'll take a mile. They're clearly doing that in respect of the um, programme for government. Mm. So my view is you don't give an inch. I've heard that before. So. Uh, anyone else care to comment? Yeah, I agree. And to an extent, Chair, the, there's a significant amount of other content to the strategy mm -hmm. in addition to the United Youth Programme, and given we're going to potentially attend the event as well, it seems unnecessary to delay to then brief us on what we may have been present for as well. Mm. Well, I can't believe that people are trying to bring two briefings on our heads within the space of two weeks. We're in danger of having no briefings. I'm just saying, just making a comment. Everybody else is making a comment, Jerry. So I thought I'd <laughs> work away. Work your away. Throw, throw my away. He's worth it as well. <laughs> work away. So, do we have a consensus that we we ask for T Buck to go ahead as scheduled? Yep. I'll be so. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Ah, so Alex, I'm just being asked also, you, I don't think you were here at this point when we uh, mentioned that the briefing uh, which we'd asked for in the future of the Office of the Attorney General of Northern Ireland uh, has been denied. That's not going to happen at this time. We, well, I'm sorry, I apologise we got delayed. Like no, no, got, that's no problem. Could we, could we ask, um, given that the, the First Minister said on the floor of the Chamber <laughs> I think now 10 weeks ago, maybe 11 weeks ago, certainly around that time, that within a few weeks would be certain about what uh, the intentions was of FMD coming around. 
the appointment or reappointment or otherwise of the mm -hmm. AG. And given that 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 they said in chamber on record in Hansard in response to an oral question that in a few weeks, given that a few weeks is less than ten or eleven, could they give us some update on that? And I also I think we should be asking if given that this is a very important uh, office, the chief legal advisor to the executive, um, are they saying that there should be no level of accountability around that office uh, in terms of its internal governance and structures? And that's a matter just left at FM to give them. Personally, it is, is the office, are they saying that the office of the attorney general is out with the uh, accountability mechanisms in terms of its internal working structures, not about the personality or the appointment, but actually how it does its business, which is essentially what uh, Dame Eilish's report was about, it was about how it did its business. Are they saying that that's something that, because the Assembly Executive Review Committee was provided with documents <coughs> in respect of the office, in advance of the office, and in advance of the Attorney General taking up that position in 2010, so why, if Assembly Executive Review Committee had access to documents in 2010 about that office in advance of the office actually being coming live, why is this committee not having that responsibility now? It seems to well, me to be. Uh, on the table papers, we have, we have actually a letter uh, from the Assembly Liaison Officer, and uh, I think to, to, to summarise it, Alex, what the Department is arguing is that the Angiolini report gives rise to policy options for FM and DFM, and it seems to be their policy not to discuss the options, but only to discuss post-event why they have taken the option that they end up taking. I'm not defending that. I'm saying that seems to be the consistent position, uh, that while policy options remain open, uh, they are unwilling to come to committee uh, and discuss those options. So, I'm sure, that's the case. But you know, uh, I'll give you a specific example. The, the current Attorney General has made himself available to both committees, and as I understand it, to parties. But I'll be correct mm -hmm. on that in terms of giving advice. The current Attorney General, that's his view. That he should be able to give advice to the committees. Certainly, he even attended um, at one committee. He even offered himself to be counsel for the committee, as far oh, as he, I recall. He certainly did, yes. And, and he, I think he might have even said that if any party might want advice, but I'll stand correct on that particular one. No, I think I think you're correct. Well, given that that's a policy that falls, that's very much about the competence of the committee structure and the authority of the assembly side as opposed to the executive side, it does seem to me that that's a policy. It should be discussed with somebody in the assembly rather than decided upon by the executive and our FMD FM. I'm using that as an example of a wider principle. So, you know, FM, if that's the view they're taking, I'm just pointing out I don't, I don't think it is a credible or sustainable position to take. Right. Well, again, and I'm absolutely not defending the department, but I think in, <coughs> it, it is consistent for the department to argue that while there are policy options available, that they keep that in-house, and clearly they believe that the Angiolini report has given rise to policy options, and they have not yet uh, come down uh, firmly on the side of, of any particular option. But, are, I mean, are you arguing that we should be asking the Attorney General himself to come to the committee? Because I'm not sure that that is, is a viable option, given the office is under review. So I, th I, th I think members, you know, unless anybody feels differently, I, th I think whether you like it or not, the department is being consistent with regard to we're still in policy development phase. So uh, before we go into closed session, then members, uh, simply to say the uh, next meeting of the committee will be Wednesday, the 22nd of the month, at two o'clock here in in room 30. So as previously discussed, we go into closed session to discuss uh, Ombudsman's proposals and because we're taking briefings uh, from Assembly Research, we have agreed that the Ombudsman and his deputy 
uh, can be present in the room uh, to hear those reports. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This 